August, and um, many of you on the call are working on those indicators as we speak, and that'll be used for next year. So, and I know this sometimes can be very confusing locally. You'll get a letter with my signature on it that says, congratulations, you've closed out this compliance concern. Followed by the next week, you might get a letter saying, hey, we have a compliance concern, and it's the same indicator, different years. So that's why sometimes it gets confusing. As I mentioned, we're um, closing out FFY18. And if um, you go to the website. Joe. Yes, sir. This yes, is Deb. Can I uh, interrupt you for just a second? Is there any way that you can display your PowerPoint not in presentation mode? Uh, yes. Yeah. Let's see here. Let me, I'm going to have to reshare differently. So I'm going to stop sharing and let me reshare. Let's see here. I'm going to share the screen this time as opposed to doing that. And if I leave it in this mode, would that help? I think it does. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I have I I have issues with that um, sometimes. I have two screens, and I know since you're recording things, sometimes it messes things up that way. So, thank you. Sorry and, for the interruption. Oh no, not a problem. All right. So as I was mentioning, um, if you go to the website today, you will see the state determination from last year that we met the top requirements. Um, of meeting the all of the federal requirements. And that's based on the FFY18 data. That's the data that was submitted on February 1st, 2020. In the very near future, you're gonna see another letter come out that says based on FFY 2019. We actually got that letter yesterday and we did once again meet that top rating. So we're going to see a new one go up, but if the public goes to the website today, um, they're going to see our state determined based on last year's submission, not the one that we submitted just a couple of months ago. Um, but once again, we did meet requirements for, and we've met requirements for so long, we actually lost count. If you if you look in the small print right here, it says for eight consecutive years. That really should have said nine because I was looking historically, and this year is the tenth consecutive year of meeting requirements. So that we are in very um, small company of states. I believe it's now down to five states that have had um, that many consecutive years of meeting requirements. So we're really proud of doing that, and it's all. Um, based on what's happening locally. We don't take credit for any of that. All we do is put the data together, but it's coming in from school divisions. And we're just very proud of Virginia for that. Most of the presentation today is moving forward. FFY 20 through 25, this new package. So we're gonna talk the rest of the time about moving forward, baseline data, what's changing, what's remaining the same, and then um, ultimately ending with um, access to that link so you can log in and help us set some of these um, targets for us. So as you can see, as I mentioned, there's 17 indicators. And as I also mentioned, there's lots of changes. Some are minor, some are extremely major, and others are just brand new components. So just a nice slide. At a glance, you'll see we had five indicators with no changes. So indicators 7, 11, 12, 15, and 16 all had absolutely no changes to the measurement itself, to how the data is collected, and so forth. So there's no need to set any new baselines. It's just moving forward. We need to have some targets for those areas. We did have some minor changes, and um, that's the federal government term, not ours. It really does come down to just clarification. Um, if there was some confusion in the last package, they tried to clarify their language. But 
no substantial changes to another um, six of the indicators. So four, five, nine, 10, 13, and 17. Representativeness is very important to the federal government. So they've expanded on the language with our two surveys, our indicator eight, which is the parent survey, and our indicator 14, which is the post-school outcome survey, where uh, LEAs call uh, students one year after graduating and ask what they're doing, okay? So with that, they want us to expand our representativeness, meaning that we're hitting all areas of the state, all races, all disabilities, and so forth, and ensuring that it is representative of the state. So there's some expanded requirements around representativeness. Doesn't really affect the LEAs, it just affects how we put the survey out and whether or not we're meeting those requirements. The bottom ones are the ones that are of most concern only because there's some major changes that we need to deal with. So indicators one and two, although the measurement themselves didn't change, it's the data source changed. So that's going to change um, dramatically uh, what the data looks like. And then indicator three, which is the assessment one that has some new components to it, and indicator six, which is Basically, you know, Deb talked about LRE for school age, that's LRE for the preschool age. And that one has a brand new component as well. So we're gonna go through each one of those indicators today and uh, take a look at the language, the measurement, and then talk about where we've been historically and where, what's some possibilities for uh, moving forward um, with some targets. So the indicator language itself, percent of youth with IEPs exiting from high school with a regular high school diploma. That's federal language, not Virginia. We don't call anything regular high school diploma. But in Virginia, a regular high school diploma is a standard diploma, an advanced studies diploma, and an IB diploma only. So those three diplomas would count in our numerators for graduation, standard, advanced, and IB. Okay. And what they're looking for is the number of students with disabilities, 14 to 21, who left with one of those three diplomas. And then on the denominator side, we're looking at all students, 14 through 21, who left otherwise with a regular diploma, as well as our state-defined diplomas, um, certificates of completion. They maxed out or they dropped out and so forth. So that's how the calculation works behind the scenes. And this is where we've been historically. So uh, the blue, that's FFY19, that's the one that was just submitted in February. So 61% was our target, 62.88 of all students with disabilities who exited high school by one of those means that I mentioned left with a standard advanced studies or IB diploma. And then you can see our targets historically. And if you went back in time, what we did in the last six years is we increased it by 4%, but we held steady for two consecutive years. So it's 56, 56, 52, 52, and then it was like 48, 48. So it went, that's how it was set up last time, okay? As we get closer and closer to um, meeting our targets, it's also more difficult. It's easy to increase when you're, tar when you're only um, having 48% of your students receive a standard diploma. As it starts getting up into the 60s, then we have some, um, it's harder to make those big gains. So on the survey, you're gonna see, and this is how the survey is set up. On the survey, you're gonna see a couple questions around graduation. And it's gonna say, based on the new baseline data, do we wanna have an annual increase of one half of a percent, one percent, one and a half percent, or more annually? And then there's an open text box where you can type something in. Do we wanna stay the same consecutive years? 
and by that I mean like 56, 56, and then have a jump and so forth. Or what other ideas do you have? Any and all comments, ideas, suggestions will be accepted and will be discussed um, after we get all of our surveys in. Okay. So right now, 62%, and we're looking for targets. Now, there are a few things to, that are key to this, some discussion points. The measurement language itself isn't changing. So two slides ago, I showed you this. This is staying exactly the same. What is going to change is we are now required to report what the feds call 618 data. That's data submitted to the federal government specifically for students with disabilities. In the past, we've aligned with ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so we used the exact same calculation that ESSA used. Um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but one and two are have the exact same thing. So we are, the data source itself is changing. I don't know where we're going to fall with the new data source. I don't know if it's going to be right near 62.88. I don't know if the 618 data aligns well with this or not. But what it is going to do is give us the opportunity to set new baseline data. So in FFY20, it's going to say baseline. And then moving forward, in FFY21 will be the increases annually. So just keep that in mind when you're answering the survey questions. Okay. Indicator two, dropout. And then um, if you do have questions, put them in the chat and Deb can interrupt me and we can talk through um, any of questions that come in through chat. All right, indicator two, dropout. This is another one that um, the measurement language itself is not changing. The data source is. This, I do know how it's going to look, and it's going to look extremely differently. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very different measurement than what it's been in, for the last 10 years that I've been doing this. Okay. So there's a there's a couple things we need to discuss here. Over the course of the last six years, we've been given the option, and they called it option one and option two, to choose our data source. Virginia has opted um, to use option two, which option, both of them, the numerators are exactly the same. Number of students age 14 to 21 had dropped out. And this is coming through to us through the SRC. So we know how many students with disabilities drop out annually based on how you guys report it locally. It's the denominator that's going to be drastically different. Option two is called annual event data. And it's the same data that comes out of the National Center for Educational Statistics Common Core of Data. But in short, what it does, it, it uses the child count. So students with disabilities child count age 14 to aging out, 21 inclusive. So that's about 75,000 kids would be in our denominator if you use option two. Option yes. one on the Yes. I'm sorry, is Go this ahead, a good Deb. time to interrupt you? You've yeah, uh, there are a couple questions in the chat box. Um, I think you must have referred to um, diploma being ID diploma, and folks are wanting to know are you referring to the applied studies diploma? Um, they're not familiar with that terminology. I okay. I'm sorry, and I didn't say ID, I said IB, International Baccalaureate. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, but I know that is a good, a good question because um, if you do go back to graduation, 
Member, the, as I mentioned, the federal government uses the term regular high school diploma. And they define regular as being a diploma that's available for anybody who meets the requirements to receive. So in Virginia, anybody has the ability to try to earn a standard diploma, an applied studies diploma, or an international baccalaureate diploma, IB, I'm sorry. The Thank you, Jeff. Ones that are, yeah, the ones that are limited are those that are less than a regular diploma and exclusive for students with disabilities, such as <coughs> the, you know, it used to be called the special diploma. I mean, that would be an example of something that if a child earns it, it's not available to everybody, therefore it's not considered regular. So that's why, that's what the feds would call a state defined diploma. And that's everything less than a standard or your certificates of completion and so forth. Okay. So yeah, so that, I know that would that's, be our applied, that would be our applied it, studies diploma at this point. That would be our applied studies diploma, yes. Okay. And was there a second question? No, I think you covered it with. Okay, That's perfect. good, yep. All righty. So going back to dropout, dropout um, for years, I mean, as long as I can remember at least the last six, they've given us the option. You can either submit 618 data for, to represent indicator two dropout or the annual event data, which is um, this common core of data that's collected through the, one of our national centers. Okay. The big difference between the two is the number really jumps by, so when you use the annual event data, the numerator is the same on both of them. The denominator really gets about 10 times bigger with annual events. It's all students age 14 to 21 inclusive with an IEP. So that's why these numbers are extremely small. We're talking um, about 1.5% or less drop out annually when you consider all kids that have IEPs who are age 14 and over. That's basically our seventh graders on up. We don't have many seventh graders dropping out. We don't have many eighth graders dropping out. So what that does is it makes for a very small number um, when you can use a denominator that's so large. Moving forward, they're gonna give us one more year to have an option. We can continue to use annual event data for this next submission if we want to. But the following five years in the six year package, they are doing away with the annual event language. So the first question that you're gonna answer on the survey is, does it make sense to set a target for one more year using this data and then switch? Or do we just switch now, just bite the bullet and switch now? Okay. Now, knowing that this 1.4% is gonna jump tenfold, most likely it's gonna say like 14% roughly moving forward for the state as well as each LEA. So this is why knowing your data story is so important because if somebody pulls down the FFY19 report to the public, and it says 1.4% dropout rate. And then the following year, it says 14% dropout rate. I can see it now. People are gonna go to school board meetings and stand up and do give their three minutes around how, what a terrible job the current administration is doing because we now have 10 times more people dropping out. In reality, the numerators in both calculations are exactly the same. We're, that tenfold increase is strictly because the denominator is so much smaller in the new 
calculation. So either we bite the bullet now, make that jump, set baseline data in FFY20 and set five years of targets, or continue down this path for one more year, set baseline data in FFY21 and then set targets. So that's one of the questions I'm gonna ask you to answer is what are your thoughts. Personally, I would rather let's just not play games and just jump to the, the required option um, as quickly as possible and just start using option one now and just get, I mean, it's like pulling a Band-Aid off. You want to pull it off now, you want to pull it off a year from now. The, the new denominator is only looking at students who left, where the old denominator is looking at all students, age 14 to 21 inclusive. The new denominator is all students who left. And there, there are some exceptions. They're not going to include those who are deceased, those who enrolled in another school district for you and so forth, or they're just temporarily absent due to illness, suspension, or so forth. But in reality, it's just going to be everybody. So if you go back up here, they left with a regular diploma, state-defined diploma, a certificate, match, maxed out or dropped out. So that's the new, the new option. Okay, so that's why these decreases seem really large because if in this, if we are moving forward with this new option, um, like dropping 1.5% seems like a very large drop. I mean, when the target's only 1.4%, you can't drop 1.5%. But in reality, that would be, if this is 10 times higher, that would be like dropping a tenth of a percent, so forth. So definitely some things to think about as you're filling this out for us. Um, greatly appreciated. I've talked about all those discussion points. Let's move forward around the indicators. Uh, this one's going to look so different to you guys, too. Um, indicators. Under the current package, we have indicator 3B and 3C. 3A was around for a while, then it went away six years ago. Um, now we have two new indicators, really. Um, 3A is back under a different format, and 3D is brand new. But there's also some other major changes. Um, here's all the language. I'm going to skip it for now and just go, here's what the old, in, in a graph, this is what the old data looked like. We collected four data points, particip participation rate, aggregate by school division, and aggregate by state for grades three through eight in high school. So, and we wanted 95% of your students participating in math, 95% participating in reading. And that was participating in whatever was appropriate for them based on their IEP. So if the VAP was appropriate, that's them participating. If the SOL is appropriate, that's them participating. Same on performance. We had aggregate totals on your performance across all grade levels, alternate standards, and grade level standards. So it was all aggregate together. So there were four numbers on the old report to the public, participation and performance in math, participation and performance in reading. The new one is broken out 24 different ways. I mean, it is, it baffles my mind when I look at it. Um, it's no longer reporting all of your students. It's only sh doing spot checks. It's going to report participation and performance in fourth grade, reading and math, eighth grade, reading and math, high school reading and math. It's going to separate your grade level standards, which are your SOLs, and your alternate standards, which are VAP. So now it's not taking those aggregate totals, it's breaking them out. And then there's another brand new one called gap in proficiency. So it's going to compare your students with disabilities taking SOLs in fourth grade, eighth grade, and high school to non-disabled peers taking SOLs and uh, give you a gap score. 
this is another one where you really have to know your data story. Not only are we setting targets for all of this, but it's going to look totally differently. Now, if you're a small school division, you can imagine that much of this data is going to be suppressed for you. If you have less than 11 students with disabilities taking the VAP in fourth grade, it'll be suppressed. Any of these 24, if you have, if, if there's 11, if there's less than 11, 10 or less taking it, then it will be suppressed using just the less than symbol. But for everybody who has 11 or more in this, it's going to be reported. Once again, you got to know your data story because I can see there's definitely some quirkiness to this. Um, when, when you're comparing year to year, which I always caution against, and everybody does it anyways, whether it's the school division or somebody in your uh, stakeholder group, the public, you're comparing last year's fourth graders to this year's fourth graders, totally different kids. Last year's eighth graders to this year's eighth graders, different kids. Um, there's just a lot of things that uh, is going to get suppressed. I think the intent of this was to be as transparent as possible, which may end up being less transparent on many school divisions. So with this said, we have to set 24 targets in indicator three this year. We have, we're going to have new baseline data, 24 baseline data, 24 targets. So um, there's a few things I want to talk about with these. Participation rate. Um, what we've done since 2005 is we've aligned with the other big education initiative. Now it's called Elementary and Secondary Education Act, ESSA. You know, it was called something else and a different regime's era and so forth. But that says 95% must take the test. We can stick with 95. The target's easy to set, 95 across the board and just stick with it. Or you have the option to set individual targets. Um, you could say 99%, 90%, whatever. So I think it makes the most sense to align with the other edu big education act, not IDEA, but align IDEA with ESSA and just stick with 95. I think it makes the most sense and do it both in reading and math across the board, across grade levels, just in, Make that your target, okay? But we also have the option to set individual targets. So if that is something that you would like to set individual targets separately by grade level and by content, then please put that comment in the survey and that will be considered as well. Um, 3B, proficiency rate. Um, we can be very discreet with this and have separate targets. We have to have separate targets, but we could have different increases for each grade level, different increases for each content area of math and reading, or we can be just, let's set baseline data and determine we want a half a percent increase, a 1% increase, a 1.5% increase, or anything else that you wish for, and just do it across the board, knowing that we can revisit targets annually. So if we set bad targets or targets that become unrealistic, or we overshoot targets and we need to increase them, we can always go back and revise those annually. So just need some input on this for, from you too, on setting targets in both math and reading, fourth grade, eighth grade, high school, for both SOLs and that. So lots to think about on this one. This is the same exact thing. It's all, your alternate achievement standards. The last one for B was your SOLs. Same exact setup that for ASOLs. And then the brand new one, your gap scores. Um, 
you're, so obviously we want the gap to decrease, not increase. So do we want the gap to decrease by a half a percent annually, 1% annually, one and a half or more? Do we want to keep it the same for a couple consecutive years? Do you have other ideas um, and so forth? So I don't know, I've never seen the gap broken out this way. So I don't know where we're gonna land, although it is gonna be, whatever we choose here, it'll be from baseline data. So we don't know what that is yet. I haven't seen the scores yet because we didn't take SOLs last year. So um, when we have the scores come in, we can set those as our baseline in fourth grade, eighth grade, high school, reading and math, and then go down from there, a half a point, one point, one and a half or more, depending on what you want. So there's a lot there. Deb, is there any questions around assessment? Because there's so much change there. All right, well, if not, we will just, we can always revisit it if you think of a question or you're still typing. All right, now we're gonna talk about indicator five. Um, indicator five has one of those, um, they call it a minor change. It really, the language, didn't change, the data didn't change. What they did is they're adding five-year-olds who are in kindergarten. So that is a significant change. I mean, it is warrants enough to set new baseline data. Although it's not one of the significant changes, it's significant enough to warrant new baseline data because now five-year-olds are divided into two groups, five-year-olds who have moved to kindergarten and five-year-olds who have remained in preschool. But with indicator five, this is the one that Dr. Lee um, chairs. So I work very closely with her and it's 5A, 5B, 5C. 5A is inside the regular class, 80% or more of the day. 5B are your self-contained kids. They're uh, around non-disabled peers less than 40% of the day. And then 5C is the one that um, gets the most uh, traction around discussion. It's because those are that are in separate schools, residential facilities, and homebound. And many of these placements are not due to anything the school has done. I mean, the, this includes placements that are, you know, hospital placements. The school doesn't have any control over uh, kids who are placed um, in the hospital and now receiving services there. So, like I said, the major change in this one is the inclusion of five-year-olds. So what the data has looked like historically since, well, since 2016, um, the target has been around 70%. We want 70% of our students with disabilities served 80% or more in the regular setting. We are always slightly under the target. So Teresa did a good job, I think, setting targets that, um, Although we are missing the target, we're close. So I think she has done a good job at setting targets um, it's for that purpose. So we can continue with 70. We can, I mean, it's gonna be new baseline data in FSY 20, and then we can go up annually. You know, you could see here, um, I believe it was like 69, 69, 70, 70, and then we had this extra year because of the election. So the extra year she chose just to leave it the same. Okay, so Teresa previously did consecutive, consecutive, and then go up one point, consecutive, consecutive, go up one point, and so forth. So any ideas um, would be appreciated on that. 5B are your ones, add term, self-contained, but that's basically what we're talking about those kids that are um, in the general setting less than 40 percent of the time um, you can see this number we want to decrease we want less kids self-contained more kids out in the general population yeah. and then we have our outplaced ones so and this also we want to decrease and this is the one that we are really moving in the wrong direction you can see um, it's been gradually increasing over the years as kids um, have more significant disabilities, maybe some mental health concerns and so forth, more kids have ended up in um, outplaced settings. Although we've been trying to um, 
decrease that number. It's actually been going the wrong way. Once again, we're looking for your stakeholder input on this. We are looking, um, this FFY20 will once again be baseline data based on the five-year-old now being included in it. And then do we want the decrease to go down, you know, a tenth of a percent, a quarter percent, a third of a percent, a half a percent, or just whatever um, you think might be more appropriate. You can put that in the narrative section of, the, of that. Okay. And I know much of this um, conference is around indicator five. So if there's a specific question to it, I'll take it at this point. Jeff, you have yes, a question in here. Do homebound or homeschooled students fall into 5C? They, where is, let me go to the measurement language exactly. Um, 5C includes separate schools, residential facilities, homebound hospital placements. So homeschooled kids by parents are not, but if a child is placed on homebound through the IEP or it has a hospital placement, then yes, they are included in the in 5C. Okay. And that's all the questions we have. Wait a minute. Um, okay, never mind. Okay. All right, so let's move on. We have indicator six now. And that the major changes we've already talked about. So that those ones take some of these uh, later indicators have more minor changes. So we're not, it won't take as long to go through them. So, but with 5C, or with um, six, we do have a new indicator. 6A and 6B are identical. So 6A are students in preschool, the majority of their time, greater than 50% with non-disabled peers. So they're in those preschool settings. They're not in separate special education classrooms, but they're actually receiving special ed services with non-disabled peers. The majority of the time is the language in the indicator, meaning 50% or greater. Okay. 6B are your outplaced ones. So those are the ones that are, so 6A we want to increase, 6B we want to decrease. So we want less kids being served in preschool settings that are separate special ed settings, okay? No changes to 6A or B, but I do want to focus a little bit on 6C because it is a new indicator. And receiving special education services in the home. So once again, these are home placements through the IEP. Okay, so this is a brand new indicator. Dawn Hendricks um, is the chair of this one. She's been reaching out to her um, preschool, her uh, leads, and so forth to gain some stakeholder input. But we would love to have some data on this or some suggestions on this around where you think the targets should fall. Once again, since it's brand new, it is gonna have baseline data. Where these other two may not um, have baseline data since we are just continuing on, we just need to continue targets. Here, 6C, we have baseline data and then there's gonna be brand new targets moving forward. Cool. Um, it is interesting with this one is um, we did reach out to the federal government to ensure that do they need, I mean, is the intent of, with, of this is that we will have less kids receiving services in the home? Because that wasn't really clear in the guidance they put out. Is, so is receiving services in the home considered a bad thing that we need to try to decrease? And so far the answer appears to be yes, that they would like to see more kids being served with non-disabled peers in regular classroom settings under 6A. Okay. Um, seven, um, there's really no changes to it per se. 
This is your preschool outcomes. This is a uh, pretty complicated indicator. There's six pieces to it. Um, we've, we've had some, let me just show you what it looks like. So there's positive social emotional skills. So there's targets around that. And the first part of the target, like A1 is, did they make any gains at all? A2 is, were the gains significant enough that they're now functioning with non-disabled peers' expectations? So the, the first part of each target is much, much higher. Like, did they make any gains? Yes, 92% of the kids made some gains, although just over half are now functioning as with their non-disabled peers. And you can see that's been pretty consistent across the board. 7A, 7B, is this, they're all set up exactly the same. This is positive social emotional skills. This is acquisition and use of knowledge. Same thing. Did you make any gains in that area? And are you now functioning as a non-disabled student for lack of better terms? So we would not, I would, frankly, I would think these are actually high because if they're now functioning as a non-disabled, we would be dismissing them from special education at a preschool age. So I, and then 7C, same thing. Use of appropriate behavior to meet your needs. Did you make any gains? Are you now functioning as a non-disabled student? Or, I mean, that's not the term they use, but that's basically, in a nutshell, what they're asking. So all of these, we're looking to increase. We're looking to increase this number, um, as well as the number functioning as non-disabled, for the most part. Okay, no changes to indicator seven. We just need to carry on. Um, there, we have kind of overshot, you can see 62%, we're only at 55, 65%, we're only at 58. So Dawn is considering setting new baseline data just because these ones we've overshot. So do we need to be uh, a little more conservative with this? And we're, we are already meeting this. So do we need to maybe up these ones and lower these ones? or just that new baseline data and move forward. So that's her thoughts now around indicator seven. Parent involvement, and I saw Hank joined us. So Hank is the indicator chair for um, the parent survey. Um, the language is remaining the same for the parent survey. This is the one where I mentioned that they want more information around representativeness. And you can see, this is what we gave them last year. And I was very proud of the fact that how well these mirrored each other, knowing that you have zero control over who turns in surveys. You can do a very good job getting it into the parents' hands, but you don't have any control over which race returns the surveys and which race uh, does not return the surveys which disabilities return the surveys, which students, parents of students with primary disabilities don't. I felt these all mirrored themselves very well. The feds did say that there was a couple big gaps here. They would like to see, um, we, the child count is rather high. 30% of our students have a primary disability of LD and we only returned less than 20%. They would like to see that gap closed. They would like, we had more white parents return the survey and less African American and Latino parents return the survey. So those are the type of things they want us to work on. And when, so that will be Hank's mission to close those gaps as well as some of these gaps. and. Um, ultimately, we don't have any control. I mean, that's, that's the message that I've been saying. Is, look, we can get it into every parent's hands, which we do. One thing I will tell you is the more, if you don't even consider race, disability, grade level, 
just get it in the parents' hands and get it back because we've, we're, we're only around 10% return rate. And I can tell you those divisions that have the lowest return rate have the worst scores. Those divisions that have the highest return rate have very high scores on, um, on the target question. So you could, here's the, we're looking around and it's percentage based, but this percentage doesn't take into account that we're only getting about a 10% return rate. So my biggest thing is let focus less on the representativeness and more on just getting more parents to return the survey. I think we'll be better off as a state. That would be my recommendation. I see a couple questions came in. Um, okay, can you, it's, Yes. Can yeah. you explain how the blue one can be higher than the orange one? Yes. Now, remember, this is, so let me go back, Jamie. The percent, these are percentages, not raw numbers, and that's how. So if the, if what we see here is about, if I'm, let me, zoom in on that one all right so about from the child count about just under 50 percent of our children are white according to the child count about a little over 60 percent of the surveys that were returned came from parents of white children. We don't know the race of the individual filling out the survey, nor should we. But all we know is the children. So that's how the blue can be higher than the orange because it's percentage based. So we would expect these numbers, if everything was equal, we would expect these numbers to mirror each other. Very similar to the way this one does. Some things make sense over here. We have our biggest gap, but we have, think of these LD kids. Um, many of these LD kids are um, very close to, uh, they have very, they're less involved. I'm trying to think of the right term. They have less involved because their, I, I, their disability is less involved. So parents become a little less involved. Look at some of these ones where autism, those can be very complex disabilities. Those parents become very involved. That's expected that very involved parents are gonna return surveys. MD, very involved parents, they're gonna return surveys. LD, parents, less involved. The disabilities are less um, involved. The parents become naturally less involved. So th to me, these are explainable, but the feds want to see it near more closely. My biggest right. thing that I can say is if you can get more surveys returned, you'll be better off in the long run. I know we're very close to the end of the time and we're getting very close. Let me see. Post-school outcomes is um, indicator 14. That's way too big. Post-school outcomes, that's, that's the other parent survey one where you're, um, this is on the other end of the spectrum. We are getting in a tremendous rate of return here. It's up, or up around approaching 70% rate of return on the number of kids who left school. So you're, you guys should commend your case managers for reaching out through social media, reaching out to, through phones, um, personal contacts and so forth, the rate of return, and the numbers show it too. We have a very high rate here. Um, we're very close, we're meeting targets and so forth. So there's really no change with 14. We just have to continue on with setting six years of targets. Um, in the end, I'm just gonna skip this. Go, um, Deb, Grace, Teresa, they, somebody will get this link into your hands. And if you can open up the link, click on it and answer the survey questions, we would love it. It's a little bit lengthy. It's probably 30 some questions. 
So definitely set a little bit of time away and give us, because people are going to fill it out and we want to make sure that every group has equal access to it and that um, all comments will be welcome. You can be straightforward, just hit some radio buttons, giving us some things, or you can write us dissertations in the narrative section. Um, everything will be considered when we set these targets. Jeff, can you put that in uh, the, the link to that survey in the chat box? Yes. Well, I say yes. Let me see. Okay. We also have one um, other question for you. Um, yeah. Is it considered a return for indicator 14 when we submit data that says we cannot get in contact with the child after the four attempts? If no, that would be we that would be one that you did not reach. And we are reaching about 70% of our students with disabilities. Okay. The requirement is that you have X number that you reach out to everybody and, you know, there's, I don't have all the rules memorized, but you reach out multiple times through various methods at various times of the day, blah, blah, blah. But um, as long as you've done that, then you've met that requirement and we are literally reaching. So we know that people aren't just out there just saying, well, I tried three times. I called them three times at noon on Wednesday and they didn't answer any of those times. So that counts as my three attempts, I'm done. There's legitimate um, time and effort being put into this and it's very much recognized how much effort we're putting into this. Um, and we're getting wonderful return rates for that. And by return rates, I mean actually talking to the student or talking to a family member who's knowledgeable about the student. All right, I believe I dropped that into the chat box. I would love to have people get in there and fill that out. Uh, it's gonna be, I mean, we really are interested in what the public says and our various stakeholder groups. So, any other questions? All righty. Well, on that note, I'm so happy.